In an increasingly superficial, apathetic and materialistic society, issues of faith and Christian values are often seen as outdated and unfashionable. To find out whether a more spiritual approach can provide a fulfilling alternative, the BBC invited five contemporary men to spend 40 days living at Worth Abbey, a Roman Catholic monastery in Sussex. We believe that what we're offering is in fact the answer to that dissatisfaction with life which many people are experiencing. Now, four weeks into their stay, each of the volunteers has embarked on an intensely personal spiritual journey. Journeys which, for some, would come to a remarkable conclusion. Life in all Benedictine monasteries is based on the rule of St. Benedict, which was written early in the 6th century as a practical and spiritual guide to monastic living. As well as working and eating with the monks, the new arrivals are required to attend church six times a day, starting at 6.20 every morning. Fresh from a job in the soft porn industry, 29-year-old Tony Burke arrived at the monastery as a non-believer, keen to challenge the religious beliefs of the monks. I'm not a bigot. I want to be convinced. If they can't convince me, I'll just go away from this thing unconvinced. You know, that's my challenge to them, and in return, their challenge to me. But after four weeks' total immersion in monastic life, Tony has grown to like the monks and respect their values. Thirty-six-year-old Gary McCormick has always struggled to like himself. In a bid to find acceptance as a troubled teenager in Northern Ireland, he joined the Protestant paramilitaries. He was in and out of prison until he found God 13 years ago. I just want to be content and at peace with who I am. And, you know, it's starting to happen. And I never, ever, ever thought in my life it would happen in a place like this here. Abbot Christopher carefully planned the group's schedule. The first fortnight was about settling into the monastic routine and absorbing Benedict's principles. Weeks three and four were set aside for more in-depth discussion of Christian values and how to interpret the Bible. This has been particularly hard for Peter Griffith. As a retired teacher and published poet, he's struggled to get beyond what he sees as the violent and sexist language of the Old Testament. My concern would be to invite you to see the text as saying something very real to your inner world. I'm just asking myself all the time, is this really relevant to us now? 37-year-old Nicholas Buxton has been on a spiritual search for the last 10 years. Now a PhD student at Cambridge, Nick is hoping his time here will rekindle some of the religious passion dampened by years of academic study. It gives you a tremendous joy. It's sort of, um, you know, you feel, you feel like you're really being who you're supposed to be. And, um, and I was very much hoping that, that, that doing this, would, I would kind of be able to reconnect with that. Anthony Wright is 32 and works for a legal publishing company. He's clashed repeatedly with some members of the group and is struggling to be open about his past. Anthony has been willing to explore the unresolved feelings of rejection by his mother, but only in private conversations with monks. I feel as if I spent my childhood crying all the time. I was very sad all the time. So this me, who I am, I created this person in order to get away a lot of the pain because half of my friends wouldn't even drink, they wouldn't even know any of this. Alongside their individual struggles, the group has also had to learn to live as a community. According to Benedict, this is the foundation on which monastic life is built. It teaches patience, understanding and forgiveness. For Anthony and Gary in particular, it's not been easy. Anthony, get up! 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 Get
Yeah. I'm coming across Mr. Man No, but I'm not. No, but I'm not. Yes, you are. All the time. Of course you are, Andy. How many people have you fell out with in a year since you've been here? It's at the beginning of the fifth week, just before the regular morning session with Father Luke, that tensions between Gary and Anthony finally boil over. Even before the whole group is assembled, Anthony has walked out and is refusing to attend. We definitely won down. Yeah, he's gone downstairs. Yeah. What are you going for? No. I'm fed up with it. You have to apologise to him, but you just go and find him because there's no point in missing this. I'm not doing nothing. I'm sorry. This morning when I walked in here, it was like I was cleaning the table or something. He said something again. I didn't say anything. And then when he tells me to shush, I just... I, I'm a loud person, so I can't help it. I'm not doing it for badness. That I could have said something mm. loads of times and haven't said anything. I've kept my mouth shut. Anyway. Shall we begin? Yes. yes. Gary has had enough of what he perceives as Anthony's arrogance. After the session, it's Tony who steps in as peacemaker. Your personality's clash, fine. Um, but don't let it ruin your your time here. Because because if you if you end up No, but saying, it won't, but it won't, but, but it won't, because I've already taken but I've it already is. learned No, but I've already learned something. And I can take that away. He's obviously learned nothing. You know, for somebody to go shh like out there. Straight with defeat within you, somebody, you're, you're thinking somebody's telling you to shut up. And, that, and, and for me, <clears throat> many's the time I've been told that, and I've just sat there like a little lamb and shut up and felt so insignificant. Well, I'm starting to feel a little significant for, the first, for, for probably the first time in my life. Just think when you're in prison, you know, the whole thing's ruled on confrontation and, and supremacy Let me ask you a question. and male domination. Let me ask you a question. And he kind of is bringing that Let with him a little bit. Prison is a word, yeah, as in confined. Does he not feel that other people have, have had themselves imprisoned in yes. other places? Yeah, of course. So why does it always feel sorry for me? And, and they, like, you know, you're always preaching that you've read the Bible and you've done this and you've done that or whatever, but you're obviously not learning anything from it. Being in a community like us here, you have to face up to yourself and you have to face up to the struggles of your past. And I don't think that he wants to do that. The fact is there is an issue. And we're in the, the, you know, the best place in the world to address that issue and get over it. We're in a monastery surrounded by religion and God and men of God, the most forgiving place on the planet. <laughs> here, here endeth the you know, I have to tell you, you're good, you know. <laughs> I have to give you that. You're good, you are. Thank you very much, Teddy. Oh, dear, man. That afternoon, although he's supposed to be working in the garden with Anthony, Gary seeks out the abbot and Father Luke. Okay. All right, abbot. Yeah. The other day when you asked me to bring up about the community meeting, I'd done it on a oh. Thursday evening, right. and uh, I think it would be very appropriate at the present time if we had a community meeting. I, I went back to my room after that thing, and I was just, I was thinking to myself, you know, it's OK going to the church six times a day and looking at this and looking at that, but if people aren't being honest with one another and trying to build that sense of community, then it's a total waste of time even bothering trying to do anything of that aspect, if you know what I mean. That evening, Gary gets his meeting. So... Gary, I think it was sort of coming from you originally. Yeah. Would you like to say what? Obviously, at the present time, there's something between Anthony and myself. I would like to be able to put input and for him to put input into my life to try and sort it out. You see, that's why I don't want to get involved in it. It's already happened. You know, I've already been told I'm not liked. I've already been told this. I've already been told that. I've been told the whole thing already. See, I'm, I've already been discussed by people in the group as well. Whereas in I don't, I have not done that with anybody, right? All these issues and these things have already happened and it's why I don't want to go there with it. I'm quite happy just to let it lie in my head, let 11 days go, let me just get off this, out of it. Why, why are you avoiding the issue? Gary, 
I just really don't want to talk to you anymore. Simple as that, really. I don't really want to talk to you, but well, I'm making an there effort we go. to do it. There we go. We're, we're, we're both happy. Because you wouldn't have neither of you. Are Listen, happy. no, I'm not happy. Because I'll tell you the reason why. Do you see, here we go again. No, hold on, don't lose your voice, mate. You know, that does not go anywhere to solving anything. Because it's just a load of raised voices. If I can't put my point across, what am I supposed to do? Sit there like a little lamb. No one should leave, but there's no point in you trying to resolve this. Because it's an impossible task. <clears throat> Anthony, could I come in? I have no interest in talking to Gary. I just didn't, I really didn't want to go there with this. And I knew this was going to happen. This is why I don't want to talk to him. But if I could really say what I'm annoyed with is the fact that you, you feel free just to say what you're thinking and to deliver it. Whereas in, I'm going to be a bit more careful about how I'm going to deliver it to you so you don't get it the wrong way. Oh, I'm really sorry that that's happened. It's like you can never get away from it, can you? Well, the, I mean, as you know, in the monastic life, we take a vow of stability, so you, you can't go in that sense. Yeah, and that, I, I mean, what we always come back to is you, the one person you can't get away from is yourself, that sort of thing. So that, I think that's part of what's going on. I admit I'm complicated, <laughs> do you know? I can be moody, I can be, I can be the whole lot of it, but I try not to put it on anybody. As soon as I think I'm behaving like that, I try and step out of the picture. That's my mechanism for me to feel safe. It's my mm. bubble. Because, you know, sorry, I didn't have a mum and I didn't have a dad and I've created my little world for me and I don't invade anybody's world. And do you know what? There are a lot of people out there who like me for my... You know, and they gradually get to know me. I don't... Give you six weeks to know you... I can't just give it you like that. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sorry. Do you like yourself? Do I like myself? Uh, sometimes. At this point right now, I don't like myself because I think I'm behaving really badly mm. and and I'm sticking my heels in and it's like... I mean, and I don't it like would it. be and great. It's really unfair that I've got this... Camera no, it would be great if... If... At the end of the six weeks, you liked yourself more. Well, I was liking myself more. <laughs> Even but before I was that, like, okay. I was liking myself more, but I didn't want to have to meet this, this, this confrontation. Yeah. It's not that I dislike him. I don't dislike him. I don't dislike him. <laughs> That's what he was trying to say to you, and I think you did well, hear it, didn't you? I wasn't listening at the time. I heard what he said. <laughs> yeah, you did sort of hear it. I wasn't it. listening at the time. I need to go away and pray a little bit. <laughs> My thought is that God has got something in store, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Yeah, I don't know what that is. I feel quite numb, because I don't know how to handle that situation. But I, I'm certainly, you know, going to spend time in prayer here tonight a wee bit and tomorrow and just ask God to help me to know how to deal with it because I don't want the fella to be isolated. I want him to be as much involved in the whole community as much as I am and uh, I just hope that he can be and, and, and can feel safe within it. I really do. The following morning tensions are still running high. The group is scheduled to visit a neighbouring monastery, a charter house of the Carthusian order, and the abbot will not let the argument disrupt his plans. Father Luke debriefed me on last night's meeting and said it was a difficult meeting, and I don't think anybody would deny that it was a difficult meeting. Um, but what I'd do is two things, really. One is just press a pause button for last night's meeting and then say something about the Carthusians. Here's the first part of my pause button, really, which is, comes from those last chapters of the rule. By following this path, they try to be first to show respect to one another with the greatest patience in tolerating weaknesses of body or character. They should even be ready to outdo each other in mutual obedience so that no one in the monastery aims at personal advantage 
but is rather concerned for the good of others. So I just want to leave that there, press that, that pause button, and just say a bit about the Carthusians who you're going to visit now. The balance of their life, it's got the same contents as ours, with which they bake a very, very different cake. They have more time on their own and less time in community. They're much more like monks who are hermits. The monks at Parkminster do not usually open their doors to visitors and have only agreed as a favour to Father Christopher. For the group, it's a unique opportunity to experience monasticism in its purest form, which Father Christopher hopes will inspire them on their own spiritual journeys. Parkminster is home to a community of 25 monks. The group is to be shown around by Father Cyril, the novice master. The monastery itself consists of individual hermitages built around the cloister, which at a quarter of a mile each side is the longest in Europe. The monks here spend 18 hours a day alone in their rooms, working, studying and praying in silence. They will only leave their cells three times a day to attend church, where they sing God's praises, mostly in Latin. It's Gregorian chant, and uh, it's, uh, so we'd be singing from these books, the various people like that were separated. And evidently, we, spe we spend about five, five and a half hours a day uh, in the office, but uh, we get up at midnight, and then midnight to about three o'clock, half past three, so you've about a three-hour stent in the middle of the night, and then mat uh, mass in the morning, and then vespers in the evening. You do it from midnight to three o'clock in the morning? Yes. It's a great time to be up. <laughs> very plain to sleep. <laughs> no, in fact, that's well, very, very traditional. The, the, those night hours, uh, they're, they're really wonderful times for prayer. Speech is permitted just twice a week, and even then only for a few hours. The Carthusians believe that it's in the silence and solitude, through continual prayer and contemplation, that their hearts will become purified and they will receive God's word. <laughs> Every morning, each monk has food delivered through the hatch of his hermitage and is left on his own to pray and reflect. Surprisingly, Father Cyril is not short of volunteers, although not many last the distance. You don't realise just how, uh, how much you depend on a whole sort of familiar things, words being said to you, people reacting to you, your sense of your own identity as to what you're doing. Solitude is merciless. You can't get away with it. Yeah. I mean, is there any way that, that what's generated here sort of permeates beyond? We can never be anything but a sort of a symbolic presence. Never that we don't expect everybody to go into a church house. But it is important that somewhere that just this, the essential thing, which is the, the, the reality of God and the reality of communion with God, it does exist in its pure form somewhere. Mm. But we know that every time a, a butterfly plants these wings, it can be felt in China. Well, yeah. Spiritually mm. speaking, if there's that sort of, if there's anything in depth that's going really an opening to God, in one sense, it's letting in a source of life and light to the, to the whole of humanity. Mm. While I was there, I felt absolutely awestruck and I felt dizzy. That singularity of purpose is taken to the ultimate extreme. I was inspired and at the same time confused because it provoked such an intense reaction in me. Thank you, Father. It's been a great privilege. I'm absolutely awesome. The degree to which the religious life is either truly sane or completely bonkers is just pushed up to the absolute limit. I mean, that's when you really have to decide what, what's what and what isn't. And the scary thing is that being there this morning, that place made a lot of sense. Back at Worth, in the wake of the Carthusian visit, Nick's prayer and meditation takes on a new intensity. And he's not the only one to have been affected. 
I was speechless, pretty much the whole way through. I'm learning and witnessing some incredibly valuable things. You know, I need to go back out and apply some of this stuff to my life and, and to the lives of the people that I come in contact with. For Anthony, meanwhile, it's time to address the fallout from the disastrous community meeting. His spiritual guide, Father James, is keen to explore why Anthony seems to provoke such a negative reaction from some people. Can I ask this question? Is there something that people are seeing in you that they are taking a dislike to, that one could explain in, a rational, in rational terms, and not just because they're, they're bigoted or prejudiced or, or no, whatever? I'm, Is there something... I think sometimes people see in me something they want, but because they can't have it and I have it, they don't like it. But could there possibly be something that they are seeing which isn't just envy? Uh, I don't know what. What do you think it is? Oh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't begin to know. I know. Because I. I don't know. Well, I'm speaking personally now. Because. Um, I, I don't think it's all envy. I think people, some people just think I'm arrogant. Well, you've said cocky before. Yeah, you? cocky. But, you know, but. You know what? Lots of people who'd be damn lies if they didn't say they were cocky within themselves. But everybody's cocky in some kind of way. What I'm trying to get to the bottom of is, 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 is the cockiness of Anthony and to see if that could be a clue to, 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 to something in his personality which, which other people react to. So, for example, we've got Joe Bloggs over there and we've got James here. OK. And James is cocky, and I'm cocky, and, uh, and, and Joe Bloggs thinking, that guy thinks a lot of himself, and it rather demeans me, it puts me down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have a go at him. No, I'm not like that. Could it be that? No, 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 I'm not like that. I never generally go and have a go at somebody. I, see, like, I, my, my, I tend to keep it inside. If I, oh, I oh. tend to keep it inside. Oh, it, but it's the regal mystery no, which is I suggestive. Tend to keep it inside. It's the regal mystery which is suggestive. I keep it inside. I'm better I, than you, mate. Well, no. I'm that's better not true. than you, mate. No, 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 no. That's not true. That's not true. I don't like where you're going with it. Yeah, I know you don't. <laughs> I want to discover what it is. Oh, don't what? Like, I want to we, discover I don't know what, what it is. is. What, what is. it is. No, Why thing is, is people I am reacting good. to you? I am way? good. I am good at... I, I have... I, all right, then, we'll sum it up. I know I have a presence. You have? You I have you. a presence. I can walk into a room and have a presence. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that. Now... No, and it's not like that at all. No, it's no, great. It's, it's not great. like that at it's all. The, it's the suit. It's, it's not it's like that. Suit. It's what a color? confidence thing. It, it, it's a, now you're... You see, this is the conversation that we're going that that you are not going to get a good reaction to because you're barking up the wrong tree. No, 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 no. Because that, that's making me sound like I'm an arrogant little twat. And I'm not like that at all. And I, I really, really take offence to that. Do you know, if I can be really frank with you, I honestly don't see where any of this conversation has gone. It's like the other night when I was having an argument with Gary. I mean, that territory that I don't want to be in. <laughs> it's like, yes. hello, I don't want to argue with you. I don't want to argue with you. And the more I say I don't want to argue with you, the more you're plaguing me to argue with you. And I'm like, well... Do you know, I, I think because... Be, just bear with me one second, Anthony. Because I think why, why you're becoming defensive, getting so defensive about this, it might well be the key to sorting something out, if only if we could unlock it. And I just wonder if there's a part of yourself which you're unwilling to explore, and it's got something to do with that virtue of humility. Benedict believed that to know God, a monk must first know himself. And silence, obedience and humility are the tools he gives them for the never-ending struggle with their own egos. A struggle which Antony seems now to have engaged with. Meanwhile, Gary has been summoned by the abbot. It would seem from what's been reported to me that um, by any normal standards, the way that you and Antony behaved towards each other was not acceptable. 
Would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely, yeah. And certainly within a monastic context, even less acceptable. So what do, what do you see as being, you know, behind that? Uh, you know, what I can say is that last night, uh, you know, I've come from that background. Although I haven't been involved in that sort of stuff for a long time, but in and out of prison, you're faced with that every day. What now are you referring to? Faced like, with? Uh, a confrontation, like it was just, most times it just ends up on a cuffs. But uh, part of what I think is he doesn't like my honesty because I'm a rough and ready person and very honest and open. And he doesn't know how to handle that. And well, as you admit yourself, you're, you're very open in that way. And yeah, but that is me, Albert. I can't... Yeah, I agree. But what I'm saying to you, Gary, is maybe one of the things you're learning is that sometimes you have to modify that to suit the different personalities. You have to adapt to yeah. seeing that he does not interpret your directness as being a good thing. And so, in your dealings with the other people, and this is straight out of Benedict's rule, there has to be this constant adapting to the personality of the other person. And I think that, for you, is the big challenge. I think the challenge for Anthony is, as you're saying, to be more open. But you can't use your personality to force that out of him. You just can't. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm aware that the last 24 hours has been difficult and still has, I think, some difficult feel about it, but I think we are um, moving through it. And I think what I want to say is that nobody is apportioning blame Somehow, what the monastic tradition invites us to do at this point is to say, well, what good thing is God going to bring out of it? Is there anything else that anybody feels they would like to say to the group about that? Is that OK to leave? That? I think you said something very interesting to me last night, that I haven't really grasped the social side of life because sometimes I put my point of view across and it's not always good for other people. You know, not even in this context, but outside, because I've seen it on the outside in the past, and me thinking that I'm right when I'm actually wrong. Yeah, it's possible um, to be right in the wrong way. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. And that, yeah, yeah, I couldn't get my head around that, but I can get my head around it now, because it's took me 12 hours to think about it, to be right but still be in the wrong, if you know right. what I mean. And uh, I think f from that context, you know, if I can change that in my life, I'll be so happy. I think so, it's also the deconstruction of the ego as well, which I think comes into it more than anything else. The humility thing. Because I can protect myself by my ego sometimes, which I think is not always a positive thing. There are times it is, but there are also times it's not, and I'm aware of it. So um, I'd say the humility thing. Yeah. The two people with the most deprived and wounded upbringings have collided in the last 24 hours. And I think that could well be the first time that each of them's got into this kind of a rage and learnt to modify their own behaviour and their own coping in a way that's made them bigger people. I'm going put a wee bit over the soil, mate, and then I can sort of take it up a bit. I'd like to think somehow that yeah. something to do with the monastic framework. So I'm feeling a little bit sort of uh, encouraged, hardly dare to think that maybe this is going to hold and go deep and long, but I think it will. I'm going to start warring all of this, the other stuff. Yeah. With the men once again feeling positive, it's time to start considering how what they've learned here will affect their lives back in the outside world. At the heart of monastic life lies the simple reality of God's call. And therefore our aim is to enable you to hear God's call. And the word we normally give to God's call is vocation. Vocation. All right. For Tony, with his growing sense of spirituality, the prospect of applying monastic values to a job in the soft porn industry is particularly challenging. Uh, 
had a strange one in church today. I don't know whether you can explain this stuff rationally, but uh, I've been thinking about this vocation thing you know, in terms of this soft porn thing. And my brain started really freewheeling. It really was as if someone was doing the thinking for me. It was quite a weird thing to be going on. Was it God or was it me? Or oh, is God, our God and me, the same person? And uh, is my supposed listening to the voice of God just the uh, me listening to my own voice of reason? Who knows? The question of vocation is also a tricky one for Nick. At the age of 37, he feels he is still searching to find his place in the world. Five years ago, he rejected the idea of becoming a priest in favor of a career in academia. His enthusiasm for the spiritual life was tempered by the very real personal sacrifices it would entail. But since visiting the Carthusians, Nick has been asking himself some difficult questions. I feel, once again, this sense of vocation to the priesthood. I don't even like saying the word. It makes me very uncomfortable because... And yet I can't deny it. I can't deny the fact of the feeling. What, I, what I'm not... What I have to determine, therefore, is whether that feeling is genuine whether that feeling is based in truth. The head is saying, come on, don't be stupid. This is ridiculous, you know, you're, 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 you're not up for it. Um, and yet there is an insistence, uh, more of a sort of instinctual urge that is pushing me, pulling me in that direction. With only two days to go, Tony is growing increasingly agitated at the prospect of returning to his normal life. Aware that his past behavior has been uncaring and even self-destructive, he's worried that what he's learned in the monastery may not be enough to sustain him. He decides to seek advice from his spiritual guide, Brother Francis, during their last session together. Gary said something to me earlier about what I'm going to do when I get back, job-wise. He said, are you going to give up? Are you going to give up your your job, you know, sort of basically sort of on kind of like moral, mm. oblique, spiritual grounds. And I said, well, no, th no, I'm not, because uh, I'm not going to go sit in a church reading the Bible and, and eating, you know, pot noodles. Mm. You know, I need to live, I need to, have, mm. I need, need, need my lifestyle, you know. Mm. So. <clears throat> so I'm just a little bit worried. Part of me really wants to keep the whole thing alive mm. and carry it through. Mm. And... Um, and I know the part of me that the minute I get out, it, it, there'll be a, a little bit of like, whew, mm. you know, sort of been there, done, yeah. done that, and it will fade. Mm. Um, I want to give you something to, um, I think, to help with what you've just described, really. And I think that over these last week, I think it is, you've been talking about vocation. And I think that's, that's very important. And vocation's about, you know, discovering who, who you really are and maybe what you should really be doing. And I think that's what we try and do here, is to discover who we really are. And uh, I, want to, I, want, I want to give you this stone, this white stone. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think for several reasons, I think. We've got, our, we've got our Christian name, we've got our family name, but we've got another name, and it's called our white stone name. And that's, that comes from the book of Revelations where the angel says that there's, your name is written on a white stone in heaven. And I think our vocation is to find out what that name is. And, uh, and I think that's, that's a lifelong quest. But you could keep this in your pocket. Yeah. And you could just hold that um, when, it, when it gets tough. But also f remember the story that you're trying to work out, well, what's my white name? What am I really meant to be doing? Who am I really meant to be? And I don't think you'll go far wrong. Cheers. I hope that'll help with that. Well, I hope it does as well. I mean, just talking, just sitting here now, 
I just feel... I do really feel quite confused by this whole thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, it's, it is easy to kind of verbalise things and... Or just verbalise anything mm -hmm. for the sake of yeah. wrapping it up in, in words, but, yeah. you know... I wouldn't bother. I wouldn't bother. I think it's a big mystery and we'd make a mistake to try and explain it away. to finish. Yeah. We'll finish now. Before we do, I want to give you a blessing. <clears throat> I'm going to put my hands on your head. Yeah. Just move that out of the way. <clears throat> Tony. May your soul calm, console, renew you. May the light of your soul guide you. May the light of your soul bless the work you do with the secret love and warmth of your heart. May the day never burden you. May dawn find you awake, alert, approaching your new day with dreams, possibilities and promises. May you go into the night blessed, sheltered and protected. It's the weirdest experience I've ever had in my life. I don't know. I think, you know, I think I'm... It was a religious experience. Profound, quite profoundly. Or I was sharing a religious experience with Francis. I think that's pretty clear.
redeemed us, Lord God of truth. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. changed everything. Something happened. Something touched me. Something spoke to me very deeply and very profoundly. But I tell you something, right, and this is me talking. This isn't someone that wanted this to happen or expected it to. When I woke up this morning, I didn't believe in this. And as I, as I speak to you now, I, I, I do. Whatever it is, and I still don't know what that is, I believe in it, because I saw it, and I felt it, and it spoke to me. And that's something which will stay with me for the rest of my life. It's the group's last full day in the monastery. But I can honestly say that this is the best thing that I've ever done in my entire life. Because I wasn't happy and I wasn't content with me. And uh, I've learned here that me is okay. Me can be accepted. So whatever happens in the future, I always have this faith that I have now. And uh, the future starts tomorrow. sense of kind of regaining the ground that I felt that I lost, the sort of mission I came in to accomplish, and the sense of something new and going forward. So renewed, made new again. After 237 church services, the group attend their final mass. come to celebrate the grace God has given each one of us and us as a community. And we celebrate this particularly tonight with Anthony, with Gary, with Nicholas, with Peter, and with Tony, their last Eucharist with us. It's been a very touching experience, an experience which has brought up anger, pain, sorrow, 
but has also brought delight, happiness and peace of mind. The grace and peace of the Lord Jesus be with you now and always. That evening the monks lay on a farewell dinner, complete with wine and conversation. We have friends in high places. After that, we had the we had the conference of obedience. I went to the shop twice too, and I never got caught. From the word go, you have four years to take final vows. Oh, I see. So, basically, you're giving four years to make up your mind. It's been quite remarkable, not just their patience and their humour, but the care and the skill that they invested in us and the sincerity which is a very underestimated virtue in our society of this monastic life is a thing that will abide with me forever. Well, what I put in this this will be short and sweet, as everyone has come to appreciate me as a man of very few words. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it really has touched my heart, just the way that uh, my life has really been touched in here, by each and every one of you. The whole time I've been here, I've never seen a bad word. I've never seen uh, anything said wrong against anybody. Not to our faces, anyway. <laughs> the great thing is that I can leave here knowing that the expectations I come with, I'm going out achieving them. And uh, I feel proud of myself for actually doing that. It's been one hell of a journey, one amazing journey, one that I would go through again, no problem. So, as they say in Mexico, what do they say in Mexico? Oh, I know what they say in Mexico. Adios, amigos. <laughs> For us as a community, it's been a tremendously enjoyable, rich experience. The most wonderful thing to see was the way that the monks welcomed the five guys and just took them as they were. <laughs> We've received a great boost to our self-confidence. We've learned a great deal about ourselves and a great deal about what we have to offer the wider world. And that was really pleasing for me and for all of us to experience that intensity of trust, mutual support, and of love in the end. I think what struck us most was what St. Benedict said about Christian living 1,500 years ago is still valid today, and not just for monks, but for everybody. <laughs> what pub was that? We did, we're just reminiscing about the, the summer of sweat. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I saw this guy, the state he was... Was taught exilium, master.